Hey guys, Jason Haber here for Future City. So on today's episode, we have State Senator Brad Hoylman on. We're talking about solutions for public housing, solutions for income inequality, solutions for housing, transportation. Don't miss this episode. A lot of good stuff with Brad. I hope you enjoy it. Check it out and let me know what you think about it. State Senator, the Brad Hoylman. Oh, wow. <laughs> What a greeting. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. I want to ask you a couple things right off the bat. First, I want to talk to you about population. Mm -hmm. The reason I want to talk to you about population is I was out with someone the other day, an economist, and we were um, looking at different houses in, in lower Manhattan. And there was this one big, giant, single-family house that we walked into, and the owner was there. And he said, um, he said, oh, you should have seen it when, when I bought it. It was chopped up into nine small apartments and you had nine people living here and everyone else in the room said oh that's you know that's terrible it's so much nicer now it's sort of restored the economist turned to us and he said you know i get what you're all saying but the economist in me hears that story and says that's why we have an affordable housing problem today because we actually don't build housing that can accommodate lots of people and now maybe that may not have been, I don't know how safe or sanitary that was, but his point was that we're not thinking about building for um, people who can aff affordable housing. And I thought that that was, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And you know, I represent uh, Greenwich Village, Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, part of the Upper West Side, the East Village, where there's a lot of former tenement housing. Right. And that's probably what you saw Perhaps it was in your district, and um, that kind of tenement housing, while it did provide a lot more rooms for families, in many cases, of course, back in the day, it was unsafe, unsanitary, hazardous. But I agree with you. I think today it's a matter of economics, and it makes a lot more sense from a monetary standpoint for these billionaires to come in and combine multiple townhouses and eventually force the rent stabilized tenant out and create a mansion in Manhattan. On my block alone on 10th Street, there's a software entrepreneur who's combining not one, not two, but three townhouses. Wow. It may be one of the largest townhouses in the village by the time he's through with it. And I can't you know, imagine to think how many families um, were pushed out of that um, you know, residence over the years when he assembled right. <laughs> this, massive, this, this massive property. So it's a sad reality that um, you know, it's, a, it's a part of the wealth index, if you ask, ask me. Uh, and I agree with you. Uh, we need to think about more, not less. But we also need to think about how we subsidize that affordable housing. Does Do the tax breaks that we fork over to developers billions of dollars a year, literally, mm -hmm. uh, paid by the city of New York. Are they working? Are we getting the affordable housing that, that we're paying for? Is giving a luxury developer an enormous 421A tax break, is it resulting in the product that we want? I, I honestly don't think so. I think the city and the state should directly subsidize affordable housing rather than go through private developers who are then you know responsible? What for does that it. look like? Like walking through that, it's an interesting idea. Well, I think we should be in the process of of contracting with affordable housing developers rather than asking developers to do it mm -hmm. to gain a tax break. Um, and I think it's much more efficient from an economic standpoint. And I think at the end of the day, we get a we actually get a better product. I actually t I've talked about. Think of Mitchell Lama. Right. I mean, that, okay. that's exactly what it, we would be doing. What do you, what do you, let me give you one housing idea. This is something that I've talked about with a few people. The city owns all these empty lots, right? What if they took those lots and had a contract with a developer to build a, a 100%, no 80-20, which I think is absurd, 100% affordable housing, and the developer was guaranteed a set return, say 6%, 5%, whatever it is. And if the rent, and the rent comes in at X, the expenses come in at Y, 
if it's under 6%, the city's going to make the developer whole only up to that 5 or 6%. If it turns out the return is, say, 8 or 9%, the developer kicks that back to the city. It basically locks in a fixed return in exchange for 100% affordability. That's my plan <laughs> well, that I've been kicking around. You know, I think a direct subsidy is a much better idea because, you know, we as citizens and as public officials don't know if we're getting our money's worth out of these you know, massive tax breaks um, that luxury developers are receiving. And, um, and, you know, it's a big problem because it's very expensive. So I think any direct subsidy is a good idea. I will say on the air in the, you know, in the notion of city lots, mm -hmm. you know, they are becoming more and more and more scarce. Right. Uh, back in the 80s during the Koch administration, there was a you know, a movement to build on city lots. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of these vacant city lots over the years have become, uh, you know, oasis, uh, you know, with community gardens. Yeah. So, you know, w that kind of plan will re revisit that struggle between community gardeners and, and you know, people who want to build affordable housing. Just in my, uh, just outside of my district, there's a, a you know, 75-year-old garden called the Elizabeth Street Garden. And the idea is to build. Um, I don't understand what that what that's about. I mean, can, but, but for it's senior housing, they want to build. They, they want to right? build senior housing on a beautiful historic garden. I think it's a mistake. You know, I think to pit you know this this you know this open space against something like as valuable as senior housing is just the wrong notion altogether. Surely there are alternatives. The community board has actually identified numerous alternatives. Right. But it's it's proceeding. So it's 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 really sad when you have these two, you know two two values like affordable housing for seniors no less and open space which is also extremely scarce and you see those being pitted against each other. But you know it goes back to the the idea that the as you suggest where you know the 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 the, the preface the the premise of how we uh, seek to build affordable housing is is broken and we need to rethink the subsidy and whether we should do it directly rather than through tax breaks to luxury developers. The bottom line is we don't need more luxury housing. Right. And that's what we're getting with 421A. We're getting more and more luxury housing. We're getting 30, 40, 50 million dollar apartments and um, you know, and they're throwing off some affordable housing. But it may not be in the areas where we want. I think the plan needs to be rethought. It's also interesting. I was in Sheep's Meadow the other night, and I was looking at the the skyline, and you see the the new luxury towers that are rising. First, they're they're casting shadows on Central Park. So when people talk about things like you know Robert Moses' vision versus Jane Jacobs' vision, you know we are still living in an age where it's okay. You're not a fan of Robert Moses. That's what right? that's the rumors. <laughs> <laughs> you read the Daily News. That's what they say about me. But but the shadows that are cast on Central Park are, you know, obviously showing where the priorities are. I think it says something about the priorities mm -hmm. of a city, number one. Number two, as you said, 30, 40, 50 million dollar uh, apartments. But I think that if we can use even technology in a way to build affordable housing, even these micro apartments that were started under the Bloomberg administration as a pilot, I don't think we talk enough about those because mm -hmm. there are ways, you know, the, you, you actually can't build up in city code apartments that are really small because it goes back to the SRO days and there were all these right. problems. But there are technological solutions that exist right now where you can have a smaller apartment that um, can be much more comfortable, it's a, right? It's a great point. I mean, these super talls, after all, are the result of technology sure. because they can build <laughs> they taller <laughs> and narrower with right. prefabricated materials. Uh, we should be thinking about that yeah. for affordable housing. On the other hand, you know, um, it's painful to see like us bending over backwards to create, you know, micro uh, units uh, when we have families that, that, sure. that need affordable housing too. So while I appreciate the notion that young entrepreneurs who just want, you know, a place to throw their, their rucksack and, and a bed, um, you know, might be an option. You know, we, we need we need homes f for families right. and, ch and kids. And, you know, and, and ultimately uh, we, we have to grapple with this solution. I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that the, you know, the, the mayor has made it a talking point, but uh, and, and has sought to even, you know, make make his plan exceed Koch's. I'm not sure, you know, 
New Yorkers are seeing the, the benefits of it. And, you know, let's let's not even talk right now or we could about public housing. And, right. the, you know, to me, the, the idea that we are subsidizing luxury developers at, to, to, for some small benefit of affordable housing totally ignores the fact that we have so many New Yorkers living in sub human right. conditions in our public housing projects across the entire city. I mean, people who haven't been on these tours, and I, and I have been on them, don't realize you're talking about, you know, sewage lines that are open, gaping holes in apartments, mold everywhere, asbestos. I mean, really completely unhazardous, hazardous conditions to, to health. And it's public, meaning right. that I'm responsible for that. And at the end of the day, government is failing our citizenry. The fact that New York State owes NYCHA over four hundred million dollars in 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 tax um, uh, subsidy that we voted for year after year uh, in the state legislature, but NYCHA hasn't been able to obtain those funds is is I mean it is such a vexing problem and it's a vexing political problem because the state won't give the money to NYCHA. NYCHA, of course, is under this federal monitor. Right. The you know there's been mismanagement at the city level, of course, and the the you know um, the rotating you know uh, number of people at NYCHA has has confused the situation. It is a royal mess. Right, right. And the other thing I think is interesting about New York State is uh, I saw in the Comptroller DiNapoli's report that something like 90% of all state debt that's been issued is issued by public authorities, meaning the votes aren't the public is in mm. electing the people controlling the, the state debt. And I think there's just a lot of inefficiencies in our system here. And a lot of that's relating to not getting the money to where it's needed. I don't know where it's going, but obviously I think we all know there's a lot of mismanagement and corruption. I mean, you just look at the MTA. Right. Um, um, and you see that the author the way authorities operate. I mean, look, you know, your villain Robert Moses <laughs> invented that did. construct to evade transparency, public scrutiny, and and interference by elected officials like me and and, and others. Um, so you know, it has resulted in a uh, I would argue. Um, you know, a, a, a real um, uh, system, as the controller has pointed out, where money is being spent and nobody knows where it's going. All right. So now we have this affordable housing crisis. We have all these issues with mass transit. And my concern and my, my question for you is it, we're now seeing population decline, potentially at least in the city. So if you look historically in any city over 6,000 years of history, population decline is like kryptonite. I mean, if, when you have population decline in the city, services erode because you lose part of the tax base. Cities can spiral. We've seen that happen in the history of this city. I wonder if this population decline is actually a decline or if it's just that people are afraid to report to the Census Bureau mm. um, because they're afraid of potentially deportation. Mm. Um, so it's about 38,000 people less than were expected uh, in the census's initial report earlier this year. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, certainly, you know, the anecdotal evidence about people undocumented being fearful for themselves and their family is widespread. Um, and in New York, you see it at, at every level of government, including our court system, where you have undocumented um, folks who are maybe a witness to a crime, maybe a victim of a crime, afraid to go to court right. because they might get arrested by ICE inside or around the courtroom where ICE sometimes are loiter and like pick up people as they enter the courtroom. I mean, the fact that our oh. court system is part of that is a real Do you have shame. constituents that come to you and talk to you about this? We have uh, not constituents, but we have legal experts um, who are constituents. Right. I'm the chair of the Senate Judiciary right. Committee, so the idea of uh, fixing that is a real uh, priority for me. Um, I carry legislation that would keep ICE out of the courtrooms in New York State, as well as 
protect individuals who are coming to or leaving courts uh, as you know as an to support the concept that our courtroom should be free of this kind of harassment and intimidation I mean we're really undermining the judicial system in multiple aspects if we can't get witnesses or victims to come forward no matter if you're documented or not I mean it's it's a problem so it does wouldn't surprise me based based on what I know about the court situation yeah. that there's an under representation um, of uh, immigrants um, in our census so there is the argument that people have made that well, with some of these new taxes, some of which you've worked directly on, whether it's the, the, the mansion tax that was just recently imposed or the pied terre tax that you're talking about, that that drives people out of the city. Is that true? I don't think there's any evidence to that. Um, time and time again, you know, look, if you want to live in Florida or Texas and not pay taxes, you know, the certain number of days that's required to do so and you have the resources to do that, you'll do it. Right. If you are, you know, so obsessed with your tax bill, no matter what your wealth is, that you want to live elsewhere, you will find a place to do it. The truth of the matter is, you know, taxes in New York are high, not the highest in the country. Right. We're actually third. And um, I would argue that you get what you pay for uh, in terms of living in Florida versus living in New York City. Um, if that's your interest, you know, um, then I think though that type of wealthy individual will do that. Um, at the same time, it's always important that we monitor that and, right. and see, you know, what the impact is. I've never seen evidence that, you know, you hear of groups like the Tax Foundation and other right-wing tax groups who, you know, who want to basically undermine our public infrastructure by by reducing taxes coming up with this notion that the wealthy are fleeing new york they've been fleeing new york for you know 50 years or longer uh, and that's because you know they care about their tax bill more than they care about the city but we have a very strong tax base in the city um and and in the state and i think that shows in our schools and our parks and our highways and subways. I mean, but we have to do more. Right. Clearly, um, our infrastructure is on the brink in so many respects. So, to me, the idea of a tax cut at any point in time is 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 really worrisome because we see the state of our mass transit. We see, you know, schools without music teachers or you know, you know, thirty kids plus in a class. We see the fact that you know there are parks and playgrounds that are in need of of being um, you know restored and and our great cultural institutions that are that are struggling too. I mean that's what makes New York City such an amazing place to live for families like ours is having these great assets in terms of infrastructure. Right. So we need to continue to support them. So I'm always thinking about ways to you know find those companies and individuals who may not be pay paying their fair share who, who who may be parking their money in new york city uh and i believe there should be a premium on that and i think that would benefit everyone so uh, fred peters who was on our show earlier i know you've had a chance to speak to his argument is that he agrees with you on the kinds of people and the populations that you want here, but he, his other argument is that there's a balancing act there because you want those people who are spending $30 million to come here and to, and to spend here. We don't want to put too much of an of a inhibition on them because they don't have, it's a purely discretionary spend if you're a pied -a -terre, right? You don't, you literally don't need it. You can, if you're only here for a few days a month, you can actually, you can stay in a hotel, you can do whatever. What's the counter argument to that? Well, I think it's, I think they're buying these homes not to just stay in New York for a night and go to the opera. I think it's an investment. I, I mean, these are the same people who look at their tax bill and say, I want to live in Florida rather mm -hmm. than Chicago or New York City. So this is a calculated financial decision on their part, in my opinion. So I, I don't think we're at that point where 
you know, the investment isn't worth it for them. I remember Mike Bloomberg once said, New York City is a luxury product. And I think to a lot of these billionaires, it is and remains so. Mm. But that's exactly why we need to keep our mass transit working. That's why we need to have our police and fire supported. That's why we need to continue to you know, finish the Hudson River Park, which is still not completed. Um, because those are the type of assets that I think the world's super rich look at and think of New York City as a safe and and um, good return on on their on their investment. I don't view New York City as that way, but you know, I'm right. not, I'm not living. But you in live a here, and like you raise your kids here, and and so you get around here too. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is on the transportation front. So speaking of Moses, is we're now thinking much better as a city about, and not just this city, but cities all over the world. I mean, uh, Barcelona has done amazing things on this. Bogota has done amazing things with their mass transit and their bus system. We're finally moving away from the car, the car, the car, the car, the car, and um, and I mean, you bike around the the city. Um, and uh, how are you finding that experience now relative to even well, just five years ago? Well, with my new collapsible helmet. So check uh, this out. I want the cameras to see this. I've never, I haven't seen one of these before. This is very it's cool. It's a beauty. Um, unfortunately, it's my third one. I told you I lost uh, <laughs> two others. So two other New Yorkers have this same helmet. You uh, put your name in there. Yeah, exactly. I got to do that. But, you know, it's important to wear a helmet. But, right. um, yeah, I mean, the bike lanes have been a huge um improvement i think for so many new yorkers uh, you know it saves money and time uh, particularly going cross town that's why i'm glad we're getting more cross right we need i, I was going to ask you about that protected right um and um you know i'd like to see elevated bike lanes like some cities yes. have and well, that's the way example. to really protect the bicycles right. when you elevate them. and you know the legislature thankfully voted in support of congestion pricing, which was a huge lift given that, you know, so many parts of the city actually don't have subways, right. um, particularly, you know, Western Queens. But my colleagues were very courageous in, in supporting that. Um, and um, so we're going to have hopefully fewer cars and more money for mass transit. That's the goal of congestion pricing, not to mention cleaner air and safer streets. Right. But bike bicycling is just, you know, one more additive to that. So it needs to be part of our transportation infrastructure. And when we think about uh, making improvements to our roads, mm -hmm. we need to think about pedestrians and cyclists. It cannot be car focused. I just um, successfully, I'm happy to say, uh, launched a study with the State Department of Transportation on Route 9A, otherwise known as the West Side Highway. So we're going to be reducing the speed limit there from 35 to 30 and, in, and, and creating a bunch of new pedestrian-friendly additions. Uh, because you on know, the highway. Uh, on the highway, because the point is, is that a lot of people use Hudson River Park, it's actually one of the most used parks in the world. Right. And um, cyclists, pedestrians, you know, um, casual, you know, walkers, um, families, you got to get across the highway. And um, I was moved to do so because a young man a couple of years ago um, crossed the highway, was struck and killed. He'd lived in New York City just a couple of months. And um, I was on the highway one day and I saw this woman putting up signs along the light post. And the sign was, um, drive like your son lives here. Mm. And she was the mother of the oh, deceased boy. individual. And it struck me like we are not doing enough right. to make the West Side Highway safer. So I worked with the State Department of Transportation and we you know, launched this, this, uh, this study, safety study with the local community boards and the other elected officials. And we're going to have some good results soon. Why is it that lowering the speed limit actually uh, helps? People don't know that. Yeah. Well, you know, along the West Side Highway, you know, I think it is just anything that gets drivers um, moving, you know, at a more reasonable speed. It's, it should be, you know, it is a, it's interestingly a state highway. Right. In the middle, you know, of our Manhattan, you know, grid. So, um, so clearly you move, you move at a slower pace, you're going to take into account 
pedestrians and cyclists. But usually I move at like five miles an hour anyway. That's true. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever hit 35. That's true. I know. It is interesting, particularly at night, though. And, you know, this, yeah, sure. uh, you know, uh, actually, this this uh, young man was, was was struck at night and killed. But Bob um, Simon also died on the West Side right. Highway, right, from that's 60 right. Minutes. I mean, it's and that's someone who's you know, went to Baghdad during the, the Iraq War and all over and all places. A Only foreign to correspondent. die in our West Side community Highway. along the West Side Highway. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not arguing for Westway or anything, yeah. uh, but uh, but we have to do something to, just to slow traffic down. We added in the legislature this year to more speed cameras uh, right. outside of uh, schools. I mean, look, I think they should be unlimited. I, I think there should be speed cameras right. everywhere. A lot of my upstate colleagues and my suburban uh, colleagues and colleagues in other boroughs think that it's just a way for the you know, city to raise revenue. But, you know, outside of my school uh, where my daughter goes on West 11th Street, there was a very dangerous incident where a car you know, came up on the sidewalk and someone right. was injured. And they were speeding. So reducing speed, making drivers know that the speed is a certain limit, and also catching them. There are also these studies on, on these speed cameras. That show if you, uh, the presence of a speed camera is enough to reduce. Yeah. So if you actually just buy old cameras that have no use, that are maybe these mm. paper mache, and you just stick them around everywhere, wow. people will respond to that, yeah. and they don't know which camera is real yeah. and which isn't, and yes. then you get the same effect at half the price. It's the... Uh, it's the Potemkin uh, village effect, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, but that is what we should be, you know, cert anything to yeah. make our streets safer is, is in my opinion, a good idea. Look, the we've got a lot of uh, elected officials now, you know, talking about getting rid of the car culture. I, I welcome that. I think yeah. it's a really great new way of thinking. I think, was it March 1st or April April 1st, 2021, when congestion pricing will kick in? Is yes. It, well, right? the, the commission is... Will, will meet and have its recommendations. You know, that that's the goal. Right. Um, there's a lot to be decided, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, hopefully there'll be a lot of public input as well as input from elected officials and community boards. Um, you know, the zone is 60th Street and below. The question is, you know, how does it work for those of us who live in the sure. zone, and some of us who might have cars who live in the zone? Will you be charged just for moving within the zone? I don't think so. Will you be charged? to go along the West Side Highway or the FDR. I don't think so. So, um, but none of this is, you know, certain. But that's the day that where Moses sort of rolls in his, in his grave. When the day mm. congestion pricing starts is everything that Robert Moses didn't believe in, which is the ease of the car of transportation over, over anything else. And that's the day where the city and state are finally, I think, removing themselves from the end of that car-centric era fully. Because now you'll have bike lanes, you'll have investment in mass transit, mm. and you'll have this emphasis on sort of decarization of the city, mm -hmm. which is really a historic move for this city. And by the way, we're behind. It's happening all over the world. And every place they do it, every place, it works. Yeah. Well, you know, we're a gas guzzling yeah. culture, big cars, you know, um, you know, m more highways. People, people would, you know, prefer to, to, to drive than walk. But the New Yorkers think differently. And, right. you know, we're the, you know, largest city closest to Europe. So <laughs> yeah. maybe that's part of the impact. Right. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. It's been so thanks informative. I'm giving you a copy of my book. It wasn't out Thank just you. for like, we're boosting sales, but Brad wanted a copy yeah, of it. Yeah, I so wanted it. He's getting it. Um, and so... Um, you know, you you were ahead of your time because, you know, you have the Business Roundtable and other groups saying that it's not just about shareholder value. Right. It's about doing good for... It's chapter two of my book. I call it Capitalism 2.0, where we can retool and use capitalism as a fulcrum for social good. Um, because so many people say now, wow, <laughs> got right to it, that capitalism is the problem. It had a um, dog ear on it. <laughs> this wasn't, I promise, this wasn't a practice before. Um, but I, I actually believe that it can be part of the, a huge part of the solution if, if retooled properly. And I think we're seeing that now in the conversation, the presidential debate too, which yeah. I think is exciting. So cool. Well, okay. thanks so much for coming. Thanks for today. having really me, Jason. Thanks for having me, Jason. Thank you. Cheers.